Hi, everybody. Matt McCleary back here, and welcome to the 21st annual Ship Finance Forum. Um, we've had a great morning, and for the last session of the day, we're going to talk about the dry bulk market, um, which is a, always a fascinating topic. We have a really just a fantastic group of, of panelists today representing um, really diverse but, but super insightful um, you know, uh, views into the market. I'm very excited that Chris Wires will be moderating the session. Chris, I'm sure, is known to many of you. He's a managing director at Stiefel and has been a shipping investment banker for many years, um, doing a lot of traditional deals, but also um, a lot of different, you know, very creative kind of advisory, strategic, M&A, and other, and other kinds of things. And I think it's that's just the perspective that, that we want to sort of have on the panel today. So just as a quick reminder, um, your um, cameras are off, your microphones are muted. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, you can just submit them into the text box, and then I will um, go through the questions, uh, you know, with about 10 minutes left in the panel. Um, so at this point, uh, I'd like to welcome you again, and uh, thanks, guys, for being with us. Uh, Chris, uh, over to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Matt. And and first off, you know, thanks a lot to um, to Matt and Marine Money for hosting this conference and allowing us all the opportunity to um, participate in it. Our dry bulk panel today, you know, has three individuals. I'm, I'm sure you guys all know them well, so they don't really need any introduction, but I'll just quickly state who they are and what company they're with. But we have John Woban Smith, who's the CEO of Genco. We have Hamish Norton, who's the president of, um, of Starbulk. And we have Gary Vogel, who's the, um, the CEO of Eagle Bulk. These are really probably, you know, three of the, if not the three leading you know, dry bulk shipping companies in, in, in the U.S. public markets today. And, you know, all these guys, you know, have done a lot of different transactions, whether it be M&A related, whether it be, whether it be financing, whether it be, you know, vessel sale and purchases. So I think we're going to get a lot of great insight. The idea of this panel is to focus on economics and finance, but we're also going to do a little bit of, um, of ESG and decarbonization discussion as well. Um, so I'll start this out by, you know, asking some general questions to the um, to the group. I've got some specific questions to ask to, um, you know, different um, panel members, and we'll, you know, we'll give the other panelists an opportunity to re respond as well. But if we start with kind of financing and um, and capitalization, which I think is top of everybody's list, and um, in 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 the marine space, um, you know, this is kind of a question to the whole group. Um, you know, given I think most of you would agree your shares trade below net asset value today, and you know, and, and you'd and you'd like there to be a lot more interest in, in 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 shares than there are, and it's you know somewhat difficult to raise you know raise capital in today's market. Um, you know, how would you kind of focus on kind of growth and fleet renewal, given kind of where your shares are trading today? And then if we look at it, you know, another way, you know, let's just say, you know, the market's gotten a lot better, um, more like the container market today where rates are, you know, better, cash flows are better, and your shares are trading, you know, at levels where, you know, they're at or, you know, above net asset value, how would how would your strategy change? And maybe, maybe John, we could start with you. Sure. I mean, look, we, um, I think in general, uh, unfortunately, we're still in a very fragmented uh, dry bulk market in the sense of number of ships, number of, of owners. It's been uh, certainly disappointing that the uh, the equities in the dry bulk space have um, not traded at or above net a asset value for uh, for quite some time. Um, you can uh, you can blame that on structural issues in the equity markets you can you can blame it on maybe investor fatigue that is that has happened um, but in terms of how I look at things going forward I, I just I just think this is a, a huge opportunity right now whether it's buying ships or, or buying equities um, because we I think there's a big dislocation that's happened in the market in terms of vessel values um, and we're for the most part at least in the medium sized classes at values that are you know, basically back to first quarter of 2016, we all remember what that environment was centered around, um, but yet freight rates are well improved off of those levels. So I think there is a, a big opportunity to buy vessels. I think the equities still trade at significant discounts. And, and again, I don't see the rational reason for that. 
Having said that, I think it's look, it's difficult to uh, to go out and raise capital. Who wants to go and raise capital um, and and push shares out that you know are below your your net asset value and in in a lot of cases significantly below your net asset value. So I, I can tell you what we're doing, and and I know some others are doing as well. We are trading out of our older ships, selling our older ships, which we've done a bunch of over the last couple months, and looking at opportunities um, for for fleet renewal and, and newer ships. It would be great to do ship for share deals. It's possible some of those are are out there, um, but you have to have a very patient uh, person or entity on on the other end. But I do think eventually, as we get into next year, I think these things start to trade better um, and closer to an asset value just because of a of a market recovery. Gary, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I share a lot of the, the views that that John has, and we too have been, you know, really renewing and 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 to some extent growing our fleet, but really more renewing. We've turned over 43% of our fleet over the last four years, acquiring 20 Ultra Maxes between zero and and four years old, and selling our older and least efficient ships, and and that process continues. And so, I think in a, in an environment where you know cash flows were more robust and shares were trading at a premium to NAV, it gives you the opportunity to be more on offense in, in terms of larger scale, but I don't think, you know, we're not, we're not sitting still in terms of using proceeds to renew, to renew the fleet. And so clearly, clearly, you know, the environment is, is very, you know, um, telling and, and we're in the midst of an uncertain environment with the pandemic. So I think, I think everyone would agree that erring on the side of, of being prudent, being cautious is that that's our, our posture at the moment, but, but we're not sitting still. Amos, I think everybody answered what they do in today's market. You're welcome to answer that as well. But what would you do if we were in, you know, a different market um, and and equity capital, you know, in theory were available to grow the business? Well, you know, I think that's what everybody hopes for is a, is a market where equity capital is available above net asset value. And, uh, you know, I think what the what the market is missing is a large uh, low leveraged, low financial leverage because the dry bulk business has huge operating leverage. You don't need financial leverage in the dry bulk business to generate good returns in a good market. Um, and in fact, since you don't get any benefit for, from, for example, the tax deduction for interest payments, debt really doesn't do that much for you in the in the uh, dry bulk market in terms of boosting returns um but you know what it does do frankly is is it tends to squeeze the equity market value in a, in a weak market and you know what investors need is a company that has low leverage that has a big market cap and you know big in the context of dry bulk shipping is mid cap you know, our ambition is to become a mid-cap when we grow up, <laughs> you know, to have maybe two billion of market cap, you know, in a down cycle so that the Fidelities uh, and other long-only investors of this world can feel safe investing in dry bulk equities. Do you think that's the future, exactly. Hamish, is to get institutions kind of refocused on this sector? Do you think the future lies in, 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 in retail or some combination? Well, look, I think if we can't get institutions interested in investing in dry bulk, it becomes a pretty depressing industry for the public market. Uh, but I think we can. You know, I think the the, the issue we have to overcome is small size and excess leverage. And if we get bigger and we reduce the leverage employed so that we can be a dividend payer in essentially every market, then I think we get the long only investor to feel safe and to come in for the long term. Turning me to my next question, which I'll throw out, you know, for the, the whole group to consider, whoever wants to go first. But, you know, a lot of people say, you know, that invest or, or shipping's been diff a difficult sector to invest in because ROIs have just been low for a long time. Ever since the financial crisis, you know, the industry's kind of 
on average fail to earn its um, earn its cost of capital. And the, you know, the question to you guys is, you know, what what can companies do differently, and what can the industry do differently, so you can generate, you know, re equity returns that you know that are you know provide you know the right risk reward to your investors. Yeah, maybe I, I'm happy to jump in. I think one, one of the things that's happening, and, and you can have a whole separate discussion as to whether it's happening through discipline or, or, or it's being imposed, and that is, you know, curtailing the supply side. I mean, dry bulk itself is a growth industry. In fact, it's only contracted one year prior to this year in the pandemic, and that was during the financial crisis. So even in the year like 16, where demand was was weak, it really has been a supply side issue. And where we see today is that the order book across dry bulk is at historic lows, particularly in the mid-sized segment, but across all of dry bulk. And so from that standpoint, it's 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 moving to a healthier place. Unfortunately, dry bulk has sustained some completely unrelated, you know, headwinds over the last few years. And and you know whether that's been trade war Asian swine flu, volley dam collapse, and now the pandemic. But these are unrelated. And, and, and when we get some clear blue skies, along with the fact that supply has been, you know, I think the, the returns will take care of themselves. And on the supply side, what's positive is that capital has become more expensive. A lot of lenders have left the space. On top of that, the lack of clarity around future fuels is, is really in the forefront now. And then you have Participants like ourselves who said we're simply not going to be part of this supply side problem, as tempting as it is to order a ship with limited, you know, uh, capital up front, we're not going to do it because we don't think it's the responsible thing to do. So you add all those things together, and I think that the industry is set it's is setting itself up really nicely, you know, for the future. And 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 so that I think is is what as an industry where we stand. And then individually, you know, companies can do things. It's about it's about of course. Hamish was talking about it, you know, balance sheet management, and then how you deploy your assets in terms of maximizing that revenue while you own it. It's not just a situation where you you pay, you get on the ride, and then the market takes you where you are, where you go. You also have the opportunity to deploy your assets and and create value around it, and that's an important part of of Eagle's value proposition. And and just to 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 add to that, you know. The, the long period of poor returns in dry bulk was caused by basically an order book, which in 2008 was, I think, something like 90% of the fleet. And, you know, it took, it has taken years, you know, over, you know, a decade and more than a decade, basically, to recover from the order book that we had in 2008. And, and now we are getting you know, probably the opposite of 2008. Basically, as uh, Gary pointed out, people are terrified to order ships today because they don't know if the ship they order today will be basically legal to operate in five years, um, you know, which, which is great because it's preventing people from ordering, which is the right reaction. Yeah, I, I I agree with with both Hamish and, and Gary. I mean, the, the the supply side of the equation is to me the most important uh, thing from from an industry that we need to keep a a lid on. And as Hamish pointed out, I think there's some structural issues that are really helping us out this time around. From a from a company standpoint, though, I I don't think anything has fundamentally changed. It's still about buying the assets at the right time in the market. And um, I think, again, I, I started to talk about this earlier. I think we're in a unique period in that asset values have come down significantly over the last 18 months, but yet freight rates have actually improved with the exception of, of the COVID related issues in, in the second quarter. So I, I think we, you know, as we go into the end of this year and then certainly going into next year and, and, and 2022 with such a low order book, return on capital numbers should be higher. Um, than we have seen in in years past. And again, I mean, I, I just I think that is the continues to be the most important facet from a company standpoint is is your entry points on uh, on asset purchases. You know, one other question around this kind of you know 
line of discussion is, you know, interest rates are, you know, low. They've been low for a long time. I think they're probably the lowest they've almost ever been at this point in time. You guys all borrow money at, you know, super low rates from um, from banks for at least a certain portion of your um, your capital structure. What what do you what do you think the low rate environment has done for shipping, and, and what do you think it's going to, you know, do going going forward? We've we've seen, you know, the stock market reach you know record highs you know largely due to you know borrowing rates going down so low but you know we haven't seen that in shipping at all i think everybody's trading near historic lows today at least in dry bulk yeah well you know i i think low rates have done good things and bad things the good thing that low rates have done for dry bulk is made the cost of working capital for our charterers essentially zero. So the charterer doesn't care how fast the cargo arrives at the destination, and that has enabled slow steaming uh, as a reaction to high fuel prices and low charter rates to stabilize the charter rate environment. If, if the cargo owner had to pay a 20% interest rate on the cargo that was at sea, he would want that ship to go as fast as possible and that would increase the carrying capacity of the fleet and depress charter rates further. So that's the only good thing that low interest rates have done. You know, the, the bad things that low interest rates have done are basically to delay scrapping, to basically delay prompt action by banks that, uh, you know, have uh, troubled, troubled loans, and basically stretch out the period that it has taken to recover from the overordering in the 2005 to 2008 period. At least that's my take. Yeah, I, look, I would just add from a macro standpoint, I think these low interest rates have really helped spawn on global stimulus efforts. And I, I think that, you know, I think that is just starting to kick in. Uh, from a dry bulk standpoint. We've certainly seen it in China, but I think, uh, uh, you know, over the next few months, we're going to see it more in Europe. We're going to see it more in Southeast Asia in general. So I actually think the low interest rates from a macro standpoint have been he very helpful on the on the commodity side uh, and for dry bulk shipping. That brings up another interesting kind of, I guess, topic if we move on to the evolving business model. Um, models of this of this space like what 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 do you guys see changing with um with, with kind of you know infrastructure plans you know in the united states and, and globally um i know dry bulk's been driven largely by infrastructure built out in china over the last you know 15 20 years you know wh wh where do you see kind of the growth i think most people think china's you know infrastructure build outs you know likely to, to slow over the next few years yeah, I mean, uh, maybe maybe I'll I'll jump in first on that. I mean, it, it's dry bulk demand has been constantly evolving uh, throughout my entire time, and so China is not going away uh, in terms of demand. But you have India as an example in terms of notwithstanding this year, which has really been challenged on the coal front, India has been growing substantially. You know, Vietnam, other emerging markets, so. It's, it's an evolution. I mean, of course, infrastructure spend anywhere is positive in terms of base commodities and, and, and even minor bulks for things like metals and things like that. But I, I think what you know, you're know you really seeing is just the typical evolution where as, as economies start to grow, you know, dry bulk needs to be there to build roads, build rail and infrastructure and, and, infrastru and infrastructure spend across the way. Is, is supportive in even in a place like the United States, which is not a huge driver for dry bulk demand. All right, thank you, Gary. Um, so I guess a, a, another line of questioning, um, you know, are, th are there other industries that you guys would, um, would compare to the, to the shipping industry? Um, you know, if you look at, you know, like the automotive industry, you know, Tesla's, you know, now got a market cap that I guess is, you know, bigger than I think the rest of the automotive industry combined. Um, you look at, you look at BP and, you know, it's gone from, you know, British Petroleum 
to um, you know potentially beyond petroleum. What 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 big changes do you see in store for for maritime, if if any? Well, I mean it's 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 pretty uh, it's it's going to be a pretty interesting ride because we have unlike essentially any other industry on the planet, a global regulator who can, you know, apply regulation without necessarily that much focus on the economic impact. Um, you know, the, the, the IMO uh, has to deal with the politics of its member states, but, um, you know, the politics of its member states are not necessarily like the politics of a domestic industrial regulation. So I think we're really going to go carbon neutral. And that's going to be wild. Yeah, I think basically shipping is probably going to be the first industry that goes carbon neutral. Um, and, you know, in, uh, in 10 years, I think, uh, you know, the the panelists on this panel, whomever they may be, are going to be discussing the relative merits of molten salt reactors versus ammonia. And do you use your ammonia in a diesel engine or a fuel cell? What what do you think is going to drive that, Hamish? I mean, right, right now, the, you know, everybody talks about it, but there aren't any, you know, there's not like a, a anybody taking like a leadership position and, and and really pressing this forward outside of I guess of IMO at least from what I can tell in in, in my seat how, how does such a you know diverse and fragmented industry like become a leader in something as well, dramatic? Well, the, the, the shipping companies are not going to lead the charge because the shipping companies don't have a research and development function, but you know the the fuel companies. Um, the engine makers, um, you know, uh, at least one nuclear reactor company is is in the game or trying to be. Um, you know, uh, basically it will be regulatory driven uh, engine and other power source maker driven fuel fuel producer driven. Um, but the shipping industry is going to be the guinea pig, I think. Um, and that's probably a good thing. I think it's going to lead to outsized profits. Honor Gary, yeah. do you guys agree, disagree? Go ahead, John. Well, I was going to say, I, I agree with Hamish. I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure if the shipping industry would be the guinea pig or not. But um, having said that, you know, Chris, your, your remark that you know, things aren't moving that quickly. I actually think things are moving fairly quickly. I mean, you've got engine manufacturers that are going to have, um, or at least they believe by 2024, an, an ammonia-based engine that they can they can put on board ships. Retrofitting will, you know, will also occur. I don't necessarily believe that that's the best way to go. Um, you know, goods need to be shipped, right? There's just no doubt about it. And um, I do see this happening um, sooner rather than later. And as, as you look out towards 2050, right, where you're going to have a supposedly a 50% reduction in greenhouse gases overall, well, that's 30 years from now. I, I'm kind of with Hamish. I, I don't know if, if Hamish is, is as aggressive as I am on this, but why wouldn't we be carbon free by 2050? I think that's an attainable goal. We, we're, things are moving a lot quicker than than you might think, and while ship you know shipping itself tends to move at a slower pace, I do think it's uh, it's going to be forced on us. Charters are demanding more. I think the iron ore majors are going to drive this more. Um, so I'm again I, I'll go back. I I agree with Hamish. I think we're going to be carbon neutral sooner than you might think. Yeah, I'd like to just pick on on two points. First of all, yes, it, shipping's fragmented, but I think it's worth pointing out things like Global Maritime Forum, getting to zero. I think the industry has recently done a good job of bringing together, you know, that that fragmented, disparate industry to make sure they have a voice at the table. It will be driven by regulators, but but making sure or trying to make sure that the regulations are, are done in a way that's appropriate and, and across the industry, and that hopefully 
if there's things like carbon levies, that that value comes back into the industry, whether it's closing the competitive competitiveness gap or you know supply side supply chain of, of fuels and things like that. So I think that's really an important important aspect to it. So um, you know I also think that one big difference you mentioned like BP, you know our our business is transporting cargo safely and efficiently. Um, that was true when sales were used. That was true with steam. That was true with coal and now fuel. And it will be true in a zero uh, emission type uh, fuel environment. But the, but the actual business itself is delivering cargo. So I, I think it's going to be exciting and it's going to have massive in impact. But I think it's also important to note that it, our business is not, you know, the the fuel itself, but it's transporting cargo. Yeah. And I do think, though, that, that this regulation around carbon emissions is going to change how the shipping industry operates in a qualitative way, uh, because, you know, basically it's going to be a few years before people are comfortable ordering ships. And what's going to happen in the meantime is there will probably be modifications to existing ships. And so, you know, you'll have like gate rudders, which are you know, fuel saving rudder design, bubblers, robotic hull cleaning, ultrasonic anti-fouling, you know, route and speed optimization, hybrid auxiliary power generation, you know, sales even. Um, and so the owner of the ship will know a lot more about the fuel consumption properties of his ship than a charterer will know. And it will become very difficult for a charterer to be willing to pay the appropriate price for the fuel efficiencies and fuel consumption quirks of a given ship. So I think it's going to force the business model to be more along the lines of having owner operators, having ship owners voyage charter and use contracts of a freightman because they will be the only ones who will really understand the properties of their ships in the future yeah I you know I, sorry hamish you, yeah. no. look i big picture i i think this is going to actually force consolidation um and because i do think um there are not going to be a lot of companies the, the smaller players are not going to be able to afford to invest in in new technology um and i do think this will drive um higher return on capital eventually uh through consolidation and a smaller pool of owners and and hopefully less fragmentation so again going forward i think the you know the strong companies that have strong balance sheets and strong know-how on the commercial and the technical side um are going to be the survivors in this and i and i think you know where we you know where we look at you know the top 10 owners owning 12 14 percent of the dry bulk fleet today i think that number could be well in excess of, of 40 to closer to 50 um, which i think would be beneficial from a from a capital return on capital standpoint so one one of the you know things that you know at least i've i've heard is you know some people think you know the best route to decarbonization is not to build new ships I'm not sure exactly how much carbon you admit building a new ship but i'm sure it's quite substantial but to you know retrofit existing ships what what's your guys thought like as we decarbonize is it are, are is it going to be new ships that are built are we going to you know retrofit existing ships you know how, what, what's what's the path forward there you know i i would say our, our view is that you know retrofitting vessels with with technology and even even now putting things on like pre-swirl post-swirl boss caps low friction coatings things like that are all helpful in terms of uh, saving fuel and ultimately, obviously, emissions, um, and then retrofitting ships from fuel standpoint, you know, of course, will be helpful. But ultimately, designing new ships, zero emission ships, is really going to be necessary to get us to the targets. And you overlay that with what I said, which is the world has enough dry bulk ships right now. Why would you put a ship into the market, you know, that's going to be here for 25 years? With, with a fuel that's likely not going to be allowed to be used. You know, it just, from an economic standpoint, you know, we think waiting and understanding what that fuel fuel choice or choices will be is, is a much more appropriate step forward. So ultimately, whether the current ships get retrofitted, or you, but waiting for a few years in terms of, you know, do, you know, building ships that likely will be obsolete, we think makes a lot of sense on a lot of levels.
we're talking about like long term what's changing with shipping if, if we look at kind of near term we you know we've just had COVID. there was you know big demand drop demand seems to have you know picked up um outlook you know still remains pretty uncertain um i think you guys now have gotten most of your crews kind of you know back home and gotten new crews on your ships but you know what what do you guys what have you guys done to um you know manage covid and you know what do you think you're going to need to do this year um before the vaccine you know gets distributed and hopefully we put this behind us look i i chris we we've done i think 95 percent of our crew changes for for this year and and you know we we took advantage of the window that really opened up in in may june and july and did did quite a bit but I don't think that challenge is is going away. I and and unfortunately the 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 numbers on uh, COVID infections are are going up around the world again. Um, there is you know light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine, but I still think we're in a situation where it's challenging to uh, move crews on and off. Um, you know we we've developed a, a very strong set of protocols it, it's worked very well for us we've had to be very creative in terms of finding countries that uh that will allow us to to offload it's caused us to have to deviate ships from time to time and and it's and it's been more expensive particularly on the travel side so obviously we need to get all of uh get all of our crew members home and uh and new crew members on board so I still think the challenge exists, though I do think, again, the, the companies that, that started doing this back in May have established very good protocols, um, testing procedures, um, almost wrapping, you know, particularly onboarding crew members, almost wrapping them in a bubble, so to speak, to get them from, from their homes to, uh, to the ship in a safe manner and keep the entire ship uh, safe and, and virus free. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it certainly increased OPEX and voyage costs, um, you know, in a, in a fairly significant way. And, uh, you know, it's made it a, a, a nightmare to operate the office at, for, for all of us. Um, you know, uh, in, in Athens right now, basically, um, you know, the, the workforce is working from, from home. And I guess the same is pretty much true in New York. Yeah. Definitely, my office is in New York, and I can say it's amazing how empty New York City is these days. Um, but I've been a couple times myself, and it's actually shocking. Um, but I'll, I'll ask one more question to this group, and then I'll you know maybe let Matt McCleary come back on and see what questions we have from the audience. But you know, Scorpio Balkers obviously announced, um, I guess, recently that it's, you know, exiting dry bulk and moving into, you know, I guess, when 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 farm construction vessels. Um, I, I'm guessing none of you guys want to do something that dramatic, but do you, what do you see kind of as opportunities outside, you know, core dry bulk? Are there other things you might pursue, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe infrastructure investments maybe other segments of shipping like like how, how do you how do you kind of you know grow your business um and hopefully you know get your shares back to you know a place where you know raising capital becomes you know a relatively straightforward thing i i, I we think that dry bulk is a really excellent opportunity frankly um you know we've been down for a long long time um, and it's not just because we've been down for a long, long time that we think we're going up, <laughs> but having been down for so long, there are fewer and fewer sources of capital that will choose to invest in dry bulk. And that has caused a shrinkage of the supply of dry bulk ships in a way that I think will be maintained even over a few years of a strong market, I think we could have a really superb opportunity in the next few years. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, Hamish. Um, I think that, um, I think we're in a, just a unique situation with such a low order book 
um, at you know six and a half percent of the global fleet. Next year, maybe one and a half percent comes on versus the demand growth estimate of five percent. Um, you know, clearly that's building off of a pretty good third and fourth quarter so far this year. We've got a you know lack of capital in the industry. We've got banks that have pulled out, um, and you know clearly the, the the three companies that are on this panel have access and good access to capital. But I don't think there are a lot of dry bulk shipping companies that can say that right now. And and I look just look at that as a very positive event. And and I can't say enough. Um, we've all talked about the supply side. That's great. But look at the dislocation that's going on in asset values versus earnings today and, and the return on capital numbers. I, I just I just think this is a very compelling opportunity. And I don't think this is a flash in the pan. I think you can put your hand on your heart and years um, looking forward with demand as well as as low supply growth um, we're in we're in a very good position right now the only thing I might I might just add also is I, I believe you know our core competency is in is in operating dry bulk mid-sized dry bulk vessels right and so using that to grow our business and becoming more efficient and and using that scale as I mentioned you know to do that, I think is is directionally where we see. That doesn't mean we wouldn't look to have closer partnerships with with cargo interests and things like that. But but really profiting from that that core competency, I think, is directionally that that's how we see how we see where we want to be as Eagle. Yeah, well, thank you. I think it's been you know very informative, and I'd love to hear what sort of questions you're getting from the audience, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank thank you guys very much. It's, it is a great discussion, and uh, we, we the questions kind of reflect that. Uh, so I'm just going to read a few things out of the box, and I'll direct them as best I can. But um, the first one is clearly uh, for you, Hamish. Um, you said that you want to be a moderately leveraged two billion dollar market cap. I think the market cap now it's about eight hundred million. How are you going to get there, and 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 when? Well. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're we're going to get there through producing uh, earnings that uh, make people um, greedy, uh, and you know their greed will entice them to buy our shares, and hopefully their their uh, their greed will pay off for them, and it will lead to them getting rich by owning our shares. Uh, but you know, it starts with good returns in the core business and uh, will use those good returns to delever and grow the company. So, okay, the next question is, I guess, a general one. Uh, the container ship market has uh, doubled in the last month, uh, charter rates, and the share prices are up 300%. Um, the question is, do you see pent up demand in the dry bulk market and how will you how will that start to present itself well it's it's not pent up demand demand in dry bulk grows slowly and it's growing slowly as it always does the problem has been that the fleet has not shrunk or the fleet has not has not grown slowly enough well the fleet is growing slowly enough now and you know nobody's ordering dry bulk ships. Uh, even if they have the money, they're not ordering dry bulk ships because they're afraid. And you know, as as I've said, you know, on previous occasions, I think Greta Thunberg should be named Commodore of the Connecticut Maritime Association. You know, basically, it's it's the the political risk of ordering a ship today that may be you know unlawful to operate in five or ten years that's pre preventing people from ordering ships and it will prevent people from ordering ships for years i believe even in a good market yeah i'm not uh, i'm not, well, I was just going to say on the pent-up demand i'm not I, I i'm not sure exactly what what they're talking about but if we're talking about post-covid pent-up demand meaning a recovery because of countries opening up and industrial production continuing to grow next year. I do think that exists. I mean, look, just on the iron ore front, we're still watching Valet try to sort out logistical issues and, and get back to, you know, 2017, 2018 production levels. So 
And I, and I think you're going to continue to see that in, in 2021. So I, I think that's there. And then I also think on the minor bulks, again, with stimulus measures around going on around the world, um, as, as Southeast Asia and Asia in general um, reopens, hopefully, hopefully India with the vaccine starts to get back to a more normalized work environment, um, I, I do think you have pent up demand. Um, as, as we go into as we go into next year post post COVID, yeah, I think I think that was the question. Stuff you know, things that didn't uh, that, w- that would have gotten done that didn't get done. Um, next question: uh, Genco and Eagle have both moved into the operating model and away from pure asset play side. Do you have plans to expand further and become increasingly asset light? So Gary, maybe you want to hit that one first. Sure. You know, I, I think the uh, we we are flexible in the fact that we build our charter book um, on a risk adjusted, you know, what we deem to be a good risk reward basis. And our view is to use our, our assets, our balance sheet to have a chartered fleet that enables us to outperform the index. We you know, I think that an asset light model is not the direction that we're going in. We, we believe that our shareholders uh, invest in Eagle because we're a ship owner, but because we have the capital committed, why would we not, if we have the, you know, the competency, why give those assets to someone else and basically garner an index return? So we're not going to an asset light model, but we can scale up the number of ships that we charter in or scale them down, frankly, which is something we did during COVID-19, where it was really about getting cargo on our own ships, keeping our own ships moving and then in a more normal environment, grow that out. But again, the focus is always risk managed basis. As I like to say, we're looking to hit singles and doubles here, not home runs on our charter fleet. Okay, John, how about you? Yeah, I don't see us moving to, a, you know, necessarily to an asset light model, though I do see us dialing up um, our forward cargo book uh, more and more. We've been very successful in that and creating arbitrage opportunities around our own fleet, but then also, Utilizing other uh, other people's vessels uh, when it makes sense and and we can make a profit on that. The company did its first COA last year uh, for for a backhaul of cement cargo. Um, we've been uh, w- you know I would say waiting in in the pool in terms of doing short term time chartered in tonnage of three to five months where we can take you know basically the first maybe two almost three months off the table from a risk standpoint by booking the cargo with it um and i i just continue to see us dialing that up and we you know we we opened an office in copenhagen uh a few years ago we've added a few uh a few individuals to that office we've moved up some operations to our to our office in denmark so we really have a full 24-hour operations center now and uh you know, we also put in place from a KPI standpoint, just for the, you know, for, for the management team as well as our charting team of beating the index by $500 a day. And so far over the last three years, we've been able to do better than that. Um, and so I, you know, again, it's, it's, I would say more of the same, more building up, but uh, not move, not moving to an asset light model per se, but using our own vessels that we can trade around. Yeah. Okay. Well, the Danish certainly know how to trade uh, dry cargo ships and uh, everything else. So it sounds like a good move. Um, with a very low order book currently in dry bulk uh, and the transition to decarbonization, that we'll see a significant share of coal come out of the market. Do you think there will be enough demand for dry commodities to support freight rates? So I guess the question is, yeah. if, if if coal volumes are diminishing, what impact does that have? I mean, the the beauty of the business in that regard is that our ships have a finite lifespan. And so, you know, on basis 25 years, 4% on average has to go away every year. And so the way I would describe it is we have the capacity to absorb that long, I think it'll be a long, slow, slow path in terms of coal. In fact, some 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 countries are still growing significantly in terms of coal demand, but long term, I think we can all agree where that trajectory is. And yes. The industry has the ability to absorb that and support freight rates. And you might have heard me say it before. I think the bigger question is whether we will do it prospectively or we'll build too many ships and then adjust. You know, I'm hoping for the former. Um, and, and I think really it's, it's going to take discipline from the industry as we go forward to realize that the next 10 years are not going to look like the last 10 years. And we need to we need to make sure that the fleet supply side adjusts to account for that. 
for everybody's benefit. Okay. Um, in the Cape size market, frictions between Australia and China seem to be ramping up. Do you believe it will be a focus point in the market, provided that 2021 will have less COVID implications? Well, so, I mean, the Capes take Australian iron ore to China, um, primarily. And there is not a good alternative for Australian iron ore in China. So, uh, you know, while I'm sure that many uh, in the Chinese government might like not to import Australian iron ore, I don't think they have a choice. Okay. Um, next question. The RCEP deal was finalized. Do you believe the market has already priced this in um, or it remains to be seen later in the year? Uh, trade trade agreement. RCEP. Do you believe the new uh, trade agreement, regional uh, trade agreement will have an impact on the market? Uh, Matt, are you referring to the the most recent one that China just just did with their partners? Yeah. 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 yeah I think that's. I, I I don't think that's. I don't know if it's been priced in or not priced in, but I think it's going to. I think it's a slow process. I think it was a a, a very big headline, and uh, and I think it's important, but I think it's going to be. I think it's. I think it's several years down the road before. Um. But before you see. Uh, see that really come to fruition and, and pay dividends. And, and it's probably more important for finished goods than dry bulk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Assuming the equity markets are, are uh, not accessible to you in 2021, how will that affect your uh, strategy? I mean, for us, not at all. Um, I mean, we have no present plans to access the equity market for any reason. Okay. John or Gary? Yeah, I, same, same for us. We have, we have no reason to access the equity markets. We, we have quite a bit of cash on our balance sheet. Um, as, as I said before, we've been selling some of our select older vessels, um, you know, low on the leverage side. So we, we have the ability, if the timing is right, to, uh, to grow. We, we don't need to go to the equity markets at this point. Okay, that's great. Gary, same. same I would thing. answer. It. I would answer it similarly. We don't have a need. Yes. Yeah. Well, you guys, you guys are in great shape. I think we're we're kind of running out of time. Um, but I want to thank you for for being with us. And you know, as I said in the beginning of the conference, you know, we we all look forward to getting together. Um, and I think you know now I think we have a little bit of a a little bit of a path as to how and when that might happen. But it's been great to, to remain connected and to have leaders like you guys um, participate in these events and answer these questions and just stay engaged in the market. Um, the table certainly seems set. I mean, you've said it, you guys are, you have capital, you have great fleets and managements, you know, it's a small order book, you know, a lot of stimulus. I mean, it, it's hard to imagine a scenario that's kind of more favorable. Uh, for your market and so I, I wish you guys all the best in uh next year and in, in, in the years to come and um and like that so thank you very much chris thanks for uh for being with us i hope you'll uh, be able to join us tomorrow we have a great day uh, we're talking about the uh, financing assets around offshore wind development so it's um it's a topic that is sort of captivated the commercial and and you know the emotional interest of, of the maritime world and uh, i hope we'll uh, we'll see you tomorrow but uh, thanks again, guys, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll see you soon. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, thanks so much. Stay well, everyone. Take care, everybody. Bye, -bye. Right, guys.